This is Jay Harwood's latest edition of Amazing Conversation with my longtime friend Ron Darling. Make you feel old. You're about to start your 18th year with SNY. Uh, sur- surpass Mets legends Bob Murphy, Ralph Kahn, Lindsey Nelson, you, Gary, and Keith, the longest running uh, broadcast team in Mets history. How does it make you feel, Ronnie? You know, Jay, it's just crazy. You know, if you add that on to. You were there uh, the day I was traded in 1982. Yeah. Um, so if you add the years that I was in a uniform for the Mets and then add these 18 years on, um, I barely know anything other than the New York Mets. And, yeah. uh, and that's a great thing, right? But uh, I don't know. Uh, Bob and, and Lindsay and Ralph, um, and especially for me, Ralph, um, held such high esteem that – I, I know we can never best them because they were the originals and they started with a new organization. And I heard all the stories about how they had to try to somehow entertain the folks who were watching loss after loss after loss. And they did that. And, and they were the greatest. Um, but I, I, I am proud to be part of a legacy of Mets announcers uh, that have so- had some of the best. I, I think that's a cool thing to be part of. And you guys were on it with the Willie Mickey, Willie Mickey and the Duke Award at the Riders' Dinner. That was the night. You know, the best part about it was you guys' speeches were right on tar- target and not 28 minutes a, a speech. That was the Torture. moment of feel the room. Uh, oh. Because the, all the people that I was sitting with just were going crazy because it was taking so long. But that being said, to tell you uh, in synopsis, uh, in a short form, what we're all about, we were asked who's Willie mickey and the duke and <laughs> keith of, keith of course said he was mickey mantle because he shares the same birthday yeah. Yeah. gary was willie mays because he had watched him play and by default i was the duke now i know everyone who knew duke snyder said he's one of the greatest guys ever so i'm i'm happy with that yeah, but that's kind of how that's kind of how our booth runs keith yeah. is number one at all times gary gets his choice and i'll, I'll take whatever's left over <laughs> well, let me let me kind of reminisce a little bit with you April 1st, 1982, I'm having dinner at uh, Bobby Valentine's house with Lee Mazzilli's his roommate. The phone rings. Frank Cash had just told him he was traded to Texas. Matt gets over the phone. They traded me to two goddamn minor leaguers. Right. I can't, I <laughs> can't you and Matt believe that, But that was his first remark, two damn minor leaguers. I kid uh, Lee Mazzilli, who has become one of my dear friends all the time I about too. That remark, and I would have probably felt the same way. Um, he had no idea who Walt Terrell was, and certainly didn't know who Ron Darling was. So, um, you know, Frank Cashin did, and that, I think that that was the most important. But from my end, I don't know if you've ever heard the story, but um, I was one of the last cuts for the Texas Rangers in 1982 in spring training. So I get called into Don Zimmer's office. He said, "Listen, kid, you're going to go go to Oklahoma City." You're going to make three or four starts. And in late April, you're going to come up and pitch for the big club against the Minnesota Twins in Texas. So I leave Pompano Beach. That's where Texas was in those days. I had a Datsun 280Z T-top. It was just so fine. I got in the car, and I'm driving to their minor league complex, as you know, was in Plant City, home of the strawberries. So I'm driving. I'm going about 90 miles an hour. The T-top's on. I'm feeling like the top of the world. You know, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the minor leagues. I'm going to be there for about three weeks and then I'm going to go to the big club. And as soon as I got to my hotel room, my light was on. And for you folks that are much younger than we are before cell phones, if your red blinking light was on in your room, it meant you had a message. So I saw that I had a message and the message was from Lou Gorman. Now Lou Gorman was a guy that I knew as a childhood uh, ball player because he was from Rhode Island. I'm from Massachusetts. So I called him back and I just figured, you know, he was out studying, you know, whatever. I said, uh, Mr. Gorman, how are you, sir? And he goes, I'm doing great. You got to be so happy. You're now with the Metropolitans. (laughs) Well, my, my first thought, Jay, was one, what's a Metropolitan? I had never heard that before. I had certainly heard the Mets, but I'd never heard the Metropolitans. And you know, Lou was such a positive guy. I said, Lou, are you trying to tell me I was traded? He says, yes, the Mets just traded for you. I said, well, I better call my home club. I called my club, and I couldn't get a hold of anyone. So it was really the Mets that told, told me about the trade, and, and the Rangers people, I think it was a solitary person that kind of traded me. 
uh, were kind of mum on the subject. But the next day was my first day meeting Jay Horowitz. Yeah, in Pocket Stango Field. That's you right. Know, but, you know, and you were a number one pick. It was kind of one year to get traded, right? And, you know, it was kind of unusual for that to happen that quickly. Do you, let me give you a quick quiz. Do you know what Walt Terrell was famous for? Oh, I, I know. I, I know I know what he was famous for, but I can't say it. I don't think uh, I mean, this was, this is a podcast, but Bar. I will not say it. No, but it was. I saw it one time, and it was really unbelievable. He had yes, he, he 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 was famous for his buoyancy. But yes, he was. <laughs> and we you know we we turned Walt Terrell into um, into Howard Johnson a couple years later. Well, uh, so uh, the other day I was speaking to Davy Johnson. Our manager, eighty-six manager, he's turned eighty years old, yeah. and that's kind of crazy, you know. To think of Davy as eighty years old, you know. I mean, you know, did, would you think, Roddy, that he was the perfect manager for that team with all the personalities we had? You know, Davy was uh, Davy was a young manager. You know, when he was uh, hired by Frank Cashin, um, considered young uh, compared to a lot of the guys in the game, and. He had a lot of forward-thinking things. But the one thing Davey knew, two things, really, that was great for that club. One, he really knew talent. And what does that mean? Well, he knows who should be playing and who should not be playing. He was great at that. And then second, and more more importantly, he just um, he had no interest in uh, what guys did off the field. He didn't care. He had his own challenges. Um, Jay, you might know a few of those anyways. But, I do, I do, Ronald. Yeah, and he was just such, such a, um, I don't know, he, he let you be a man, even if, if you had to take a couple of stumbles to figure out what that was all about. And, and um, But I think the most important is that he knew who to play against what pitcher or what hitter, and uh, that, that separated him. He fought like hell to bring Doc up in, in 84. A lot of people didn't want to bring him up, 19-year-old guy, and Davey fought like hell to, 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 you know, to bring him up. Uh, but two things I remember about him. I don't remember, and, and I mean, one of the games I want to talk about, in the 86 series, we lose the first two games. Davey blows off a mandatory workout at Fenwick Park. And if I remember correctly, it was me, you, Davey, Bobby O, and we went to uh, Fenwick Park for the press conference against all the rules, I need to give my guys some rest. Yeah, uh, Mel Stottlemyre was there as well. I, I think um, I think they, they, both Bobby and I had to do, play some catch and throw on the side and all those things. That's why we were there. Um, I'm sure it was pure hell for you, Jay, because that was your job, and you had to at some point explain to Major League Baseball that the Mighty Mets uh, were not coming to the ball. Well, off mandatory practice. A, exactly. And um, – but Davey read his players. He knew that they were tired. It wasn't the Red Sox' first two games. It was the six-game series against the Astros, who were such a formidable team that we were lucky to get by them. And they took a lot out of us. You know, it was kind of like a prize fight where, you know, you can't fight for another six months because you've been bloodied and tattered. But um, he, he read the room right, kept the guys at home. They all got their rest, and we came out firing on games three and four. But um, I remember uh, Bobby, I, Bobby O and I, and, and we took not we didn't take a lot of heat, but Bobby and I uh, had to answer all the questions. Two right. reasons: one, Bobby was going back to his old stomping grounds; he had been traded to us from Red Sox a year prior. And you I was were, a kid. Like you were too, in a way, because you were. From yeah, well, I was a kid from that area, so that why that's why it was a cool kind of local story for the local Boston writers. Well, it came up big in Game Four. Bobby wins Game Three. You have seven shattered innings. Get us back, you know, two two. You remember how many tickets did you leave that night, Ronnie? I think I left about sixty. Yeah, sixty tickets. So, you know, with what you made in those days, um, I kind of worked for free those seven innings. Um, but it was it was delightful. Um, my parents and all of my friends when I was a kid. I mean, when I played little league baseball, everyone I knew uh, was hoping someday they'd be in Fenway Park. And so was I. I just didn't know it was going to be for another team, and not the Red Sox. And uh, but it was um, it was just remarkable. You know, I come from such a small town that all of us kind of got to share that game four together. Get back to Davey for a second uh, about the infamous plane ride from from Houston. The uh, the the airline wanted to find us ten grand, and I remember Davey ripping up the check in the clubhouse, 
and it got all the guys revved up too. For he he wasn't he was brash and bold. He didn't need the job. He was a rich guy, but he he always had the players' backs. Yeah, you know, D- Davey was. Um... You know, you always talk about the, that Mets team is brash and bold. Davey might have been the most brash and bold of, of, of everyone. No one had more confidence uh, uh, than, than he. And I remember that Houston flight because I was sitting in the very back with Randy Neiman. And we were not partaking of any beers or anything because I had, you know, I, I was pitching game one. So I was as nervous as nervous can be. And we were just kind of watching the festivities in front. And uh, what made it. Not funny, because I'm, I'm sure people today would find it appalling. But what made it funny in that time, in that context, is that you had to know the story behind it. Gary Carter and Keith Hernandez had been fighting Frank Cashin for months to include the wives on the plane. In those days, wives and children weren't allowed on the plane. They weren't even allowed in the locker room. They weren't allowed anywhere. It, it just... It, it, it wasn't a very inclusive kind of fraternity. It was exclusive. And uh, they fought him tooth and nail, and then finally fl- Frank relented. And on that flight home, we had all the wives and, 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 the, and the girlfriends um, uh, came on that plane. Uh, let's just say that um, the players and their significant others together formed quite a team. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a memorable. But I just remember when, 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 when Frank, I, I, I don't know what he did in front of everybody, but I know when he was presented the check, he ripped it up, you know. And, yeah, and, I think he did it in front of everyone, in fact. Yeah. He said, you know, um, I got to talk to you guys about this bill I got because we wrecked the plane coming back from the Astros. And now I'm paraphrasing now. This is my memory. Uh, this is what I think about this bill. And he ripped it up and threw it in the trash. Yeah, and of course, uh, that whole team went nuts. It, it was great. Right, let me tell you, you, you get very few days off. I know people, you know, you work for SNY, you do the TBS games in midweek, uh, and then postseason two. How do you, you have to learn more about the Mets. How do you stop learning? I mean, you, you got to constantly update, you know, when you do the, you know, when you do the hot stove and all the other shows. Yeah. How, how do you balance that all out? I mean, there's a lot of reading, a lot of learning and keep it up with yeah. things. Yeah, Jay, you know, it's the greatest gift I've ever been given in some ways uh, because, um, you know, I'm able to, in our Mets broadcast, bring kind of a, uh, uh, um, a, a big world view towards the game of baseball because I do know uh, the first two or three guys that are great prospects for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, not many people know that. I know that just because of my MLB job. Um, I always say the difference between doing Mets games and postseason games is that during the regular season, Gary, Keith, and I are trying to uh, we're trying to write uh, a story about that season, the ups and the ga- downs, the good things, the bad things, all of that thing. We're trying to tie into this really beautiful package, and the postseason is different. I know that you've worked forever in the regular season and the postseason. Right. The postseason, you're really trying to be a caretaker for these athletes that are in the postseason to make sure that their experience is the best that someday when they're listening to the call of a home run, they might've hit to win a game. uh, And they're showing it to their grandchild. It's as special um, in 1986 as it will be in 2086. So um, those, those, all of those things and those different hats that I wear, I think help every job that I do. So even though I'm working and maybe I'm working a lot, I, I still have plenty of time off. Um, even though I'm working and working a lot, all of those jobs kind of circle me into knowing as much as I can about the game, not only the Mets, but also the Pirates and the Dodgers and the Padres and whatever. And it makes for when I go on the road and I have to do a you know, broadcast of just maybe Gary and I, that I can talk about things that I, I certainly wouldn't have known if I didn't have my other jobs. There's no real offseason for you. Well, you know, you baseball now is is – 12 months, 20 score seven kind of sport. It wasn't like that when I played. You majorly debut uh, September 13th, 83. You you retired aside three Hall of Famers. Uh, Joe Morgan, Mike Schmidt, I may have the order wrong with. You struck out Rose, struck out Morgan Wright, and Schmidt grounded out. September 6th, 1983, there were about 4,000 people in the stands. I could hear my mom like I was playing in an American Legion game. Um, and... Uh, 
It did. Uh, Joe Morgan led off. Pete Rose hit second. Mike Schmidt hit third. Strikeout, strikeout, ground out. And I always say that somehow, some way, if they deem it worthy and put Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame, I have to be the only person that the first three hitters he ever faced in his debut are three Hall of Famers. So if we can make that happen, um, then at least I'll be a good answer to a trivia question. You know what, Roy? Pete was always nice to me when I first started. He always came over and said hello and, you know, whatever. I mean, I just don't want to have a truck, but I mean, he was always nice to me one-on-one. And, you know, what I remember about him, you remember the fight that he and Bill Robinson had in Cincinnati right at first base where he was right around here and Uncle Bill got to a fight there. And uh, that was one of the things I, I remember. The other, the other game I wanted to talk about, October 1st, 85, against John Tudor. I, I predicted that we're in the last we're a couple of weeks of the pennant race. We really have to sweep the Cardinals, take three or four. You pitch nine shut in innings. We win the game in the 11th city, and then with a moonshot by Darrell against Ken Daly off the clock. Well, uh, you know, you know this better than I know it because you had to deal with the fallout from it. But, you know, Dwight was having his magical year. He went 24 and 4. ZRA is 1.53. No one could hit him, and he was even better in the month of September than he had been all season long. John Tudor that year would have won the Cy Young if it had not been for Dwight. He started the season 1-7 and seven and then reeled off, I believe, 20 straight wins. So that's who I was facing in the first game, and all the reporters thought it was crazy that Davey would not start Dwight, pitch me in game two. And Davey um, just said, hey, listen, we have to win all three. So if we somehow win game one with Darling, then I have Gooden to get us through game two. And and all of a sudden, we're looking at a sweep. So I felt the pressure of of having to perform. Probably had one of the, I I think, the first big game of my career. And you probably won't remember this, but in those days, you know, before, the day before you pitched, you certainly would, would talk with some of the reporters and say, Hey, yeah, I feel good. And, you know, it's going to be, you know, all the, all the, uh, all the cliches, you know, it's going to be tough. They're a good team. You know, I'm going to have to keep uh, Vince Coleman off the bases, you know, that kind of stuff, just cliches. But that was the first time you would ask me the next day after the game was, I came on the bench, I was going to get my work in. And you said, Hey, the reporters here want to talk to you. And I said, what? What? Like the, the day after a game? It's like, uh, you don't understand how big that game was. Uh, they want to talk to you. So I ended up sitting the day after, which was unprecedented. It just didn't ever do that. Uh, maybe Dwight did it, but I, I know I never did it. And and it was like 30 reporters, and they just kept peppering peppering me with questions like, now, do you feel like a major leaguer now with that effort last night? And my first thought was I already thought I was a major leaguer, but now I kind of got it that, you know, how you make your mark in New York is that, you know, you stay – you act accordingly, you show you're trying real hard and that you care, and you start to pitch in big games. And uh, that was my first one. As a pitching aficionado, how was Verlander able to do the things he did from being on, you know, Tommy John Surrey to winning the side one the next year? I mean, how, how does that happen? Well, I think with Justin, um, Jay, you know, he's always been such a competitor, bulldog, um, always tough as nails. And I think all of those things served him well when he got hurt. And he spent that year and a half uh, kind of away from the mound. And I think also, and, you know, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn. You know, I I think he met the love of his life uh, in that time and got to spend time with his his new wife and his uh, new daughter. And um, being a father and being away from the game makes you realize um, your perspective and what should be in certain orders. And I think, uh, and this is my opinion, I, I think watching Justin now, he enjoys the competition, I think, more than he ever has. You know, I think when you're a young ball player and you're as good as he is, there's a lot of uh, your legacy. You know, what kind of legacy am I going to leave in this game? And once you get rid of that, and I think that his legacy is secure, you know, he's certainly going to be a Hall of Famer, um, you start to enjoy the competition, you start to enjoy your teammates. You start to enjoy things that happen on the road and and most certainly uh, uh, become a more well-rounded Renaissance individual. And um, that's a, that's what he has become. Now, think about it. He's 39 years old, but he's got a brand new elbow. 
I mean, who knows how long he can pitch? You know, maybe there's other parts that might not last as long, but as far as his arm's concerned, he's still got a lot of 95 in there. So uh, uh, he's, he, he might do some stuff that, that other pitchers have done gr- uh, well late into their careers. He might be the next. Right, he's a baseball reserver. What are the one or two things for the Mets to keep, you know, not maybe one a hard one game, but be in position for the postseason? What are one or two things that have to happen? Do you think? Uh, well, I, I think the one thing that they have now until they start getting some of their prized prospects up in the major leagues is that they are a little older team, you know. And if you're an older team, health uh, is so important. So, um, you know, we talk about it all the time in the NBA, load management, right? Um, I think uh, the Mets are going to have to do a, an amazing job of just keeping their talented, uh, older, uh, veteran players on the field. Uh, that's number one. And I, and I think that the, the other one, I, I didn't see them doing anything wrong last year, Jay. It was an incredible season. So many great moments. Um, they got chased down by the Braves, but that says more about the Braves, I think, than it says yeah, about the Mets. The Braves just uh, pulled it together. And listen, they've been a great organization since the early 90s. That has not changed. You know, they're all, the Mets are always going to be battling those guys. But I would take all the positives from last year. I thought they came together as a team. I thought they did had a lot of big moments. But if I had to pick one player that I think is going to be the most important, vital, because I think it's his time, um, I think Pete Alonso, at the end of the day, will have uh, will take a run at the MVP. Um, he's done everything else in his career. He's been Rookie of the Year. He's proven he's one of the best sluggers in the game. Last year. He proved he's one of the better hitters in the game. 35 times, Jay, last year he had a hit to tie a game or to put the Mets ahead. It tells you how valuable he is. So um, that he's my pick for the MVP. If he is the MVP, uh, the Mets will be going back to the post. I don't want to, as we close, I don't want to embarrass you this, but a lot of people don't, might not know about you for years and years and years and years. Your foundation did a lot of good things in the city. Uh, how Superstorm Sandy, you didn't, you didn't pick out these great, humongous causes. You try to local communities and and you know and, and help people, people to people, not corporation to corporation. What was your philosophy of doing it the way you did it like that, Ronnie? You know, when I first got involved in, in giving, and and it all comes from Rusty Staub, your good friend, right. the late great Rusty, uh, uh, devoted all of his time off the field to helping firefighters and the widows of firefighters and police officers and their children. And of course, after 9-11, uh, his charity became one of the, the biggest charities, um, not only in New York, but in the world. So he instilled in all of us young players that if you could do something, do something. My motto kind of was real money to real people with real needs. What does that mean? Well, it meant that um, when, when, you look, when you become a Mets player, you're involved with all the boroughs of New York, tri-state New York, really, uh, New York, Connecticut, um, New Jersey. And uh, you just see a lot of stuff that you could help. I remember the first real thing we did is one of the ball teams from Spanish Harlem could not pay their rent. I didn't know this. You have to rent a field in Manhattan for the summer for your league. I didn't know that even was a, a reality. And we were able to pay their rent. So all those kids of that league got to play for the summer. Um, it was those kinds of small things that we tried to do. And, and the most satisfying, I think, was after Hurricane Sandy. And you alluded to it, but um, people lost their homes. And we were lucky with Bob's Discount Furniture. We got together. And we uh, raised enough money that if we gave 5000 Bob's Discount Furniture would match it. So we were able to give six families um, $10,000 each award to go to Bob's Discount Furniture and the Furniture House. I remember um, that was uh, growing up in, you know, kind of lower middle class in Massachusetts. I was thinking, what a gift, you know, that someone's going to be able to, after losing their home, be able to put new furniture into it. Um, I remember that was the most emotional I got. But helping people is, uh, uh, yeah. you, get, you, you know, you get more out of it than you give to it. Speaking of emotions, I can't with you sitting there that all you did for my dear co-worker, Shannon Ford, you helped raise money for her. You went to her dinner, went to the field, you know, for her 
anytime we needed something to raise money for Shannon, you were always there. We said, I can't, you know, anytime I could bring her name up, I will. And, wow. and with, with you sitting there, I just, uh, all you did behind the scenes, making trips in from Manhattan to New Jersey to do different things, hosting a fundraiser for her, not forgotten, really, not forgotten. Well, uh, Shannon Ford, uh, you know this better than anyone. And, and what's great about what you did, Jay, is that you made her name. Uh, all Mets fans will know Shannon Ford forever. And and um, she was just, uh, you know, if you meet five special people in your life, you're pretty lucky. She was definitely one. You know, I spoke to Maz just before I told him was doing his podcast with you, and he said he thinks the Mets now got the better of the trade, just so you know. He said, oh. he said he think the Mets got the better of the trade. He didn't live up to his expectations when he went to the Rangers. Listen, he said he got the they got the best of the trade now because we brought him back in '86. So yeah, I guess you know. key, right? We got to give all the league credit. In '86, he got a lot of key pitch hits, and uh, we do it. Listen, I appreciate the time. I appreciate our friendship, and I look forward to seeing you soon.